world produces an estimated 4.2 billion tons of concrete annually. To put this into perspective, this would be the equivalent of approximately 400 concrete trucks getting filled every single minute of every day throughout the entire year. In fact, concrete is the second most widely used substance on earth only next to water itself. In today's video, we're gonna learn as much as we can about concrete, including the science behind it, as well as the future of concrete in the construction industry. So let's go. So concrete is a composite construction material made of four ingredients, which are one, fine aggregates such as sand, two, medium or larger aggregates such as gravel, three, cement which is a binding agent now we can think of cement as the glue that holds it all together the most common types of cements are variations of portland cement which i've shared some information about on the screen if you'd like to pause and review and number four the fourth ingredient is water so how do we get concrete out of these four fairly common raw materials well concrete is formed through a chemical reaction known as hydration when major compounds in cement interact with water molecules, they form chemical bonds, which then become hydrates or hydration products, most notably calcium silicate hydrates or CSH. These hydration products crystallize and these crystals interlock with one another, which forms concrete and gives it that high compressive strength. Now, cement hydration is an exothermic reaction meaning it generates heat during the chemical process. The ideal temperature for this chemical reaction is anywhere between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. However, internal temperatures can rise to as high as 160 degrees Fahrenheit during this chemical reaction. So the full hydration process for concrete typically takes around 28 days. Your concrete should typically hit 70% of its full strength at the seven day mark and 100% of its strength at the 28 day mark. In reality, it will most likely hit 100% at that seven day mark, which we'll get to later in this video. So not all buildings, roadways, bridges, and sidewalks require the same type of concrete. One of the main characteristics of concrete that would change based on its purpose is the strength of the concrete. Now, concrete strength is measured in PSI, or pounds per square inch. This measurement is completed by applying pressure to a sample of concrete until it breaks. So the strength required for building elements such as sidewalks, footings, foundations, and slabs are all designed through a series of calculations by a structural engineer based on imposed loads. I've included some examples of concrete PSI numbers based on application but again, these will be project specific and could be different based on load calculations. So concrete is also very versatile. By adjusting different quantities of the four main raw materials in concrete, we would actually produce different characteristics within the final product. This would be referred to as the mix design in construction. So every concrete batch plant has a recipe book and to achieve the concrete strength, finish, workability, these concrete suppliers utilize different mix designs in order to achieve different concrete applications on the project. So batch plants will create these mix designs and they'll test them internally for the concrete's characteristics such as its strength and PSI, as well as other characteristics such as its slump. Now slump measures how easily concrete flows and is important because it is directly related to workability while placing the concrete on a job site. High slump concrete is more fluid and workable than low slump concrete. But to achieve high slump concrete, you typically need more water, which reduces the overall strength of the concrete. So these mix designs are tested multiple times to ensure that there is exactly the right balance of raw materials, including water, to make the ideal concrete. Two other items I quickly want to mention are one, fly ash. So fly ash is a byproduct of coal combustion and is a binding agent similar to Portland cement. Now fly ash cannot fully replace Portland cement, but instead is used to supplement Portland cement. It's cheaper and arguably more sustainable, but has also been noted to be inconsistent. 
So structural engineers might allow 20% fly ash with your Portland cement, meaning you would decrease the Portland cement down to 80% and add 20% fly ash in its place. And number two, slag cement, which is similar to fly ash and is used to partially supplement Portland cement when approved. Slag cement is a byproduct of steel making, offering sustainable benefits, but slag cement notably provides a slower setting time and lower early strength results in the overall concrete. So the construction industry couldn't help themselves when it came to these four simple raw material ingredients for this recipe that makes concrete. Individuals have been testing further additional ingredients or other raw materials to customize concrete to serve more specific needs. So these adjustments have been accomplished through the introduction and use of additives or admixtures, which are chemical modifiers added into the mix design to change the outcome of the concrete. Types of admixtures would include the following, starting with number one, air and trainers, which are used to improve the resistance of the concrete against severe frost action and freeze thaw cycles. Think of concrete exposed to frozen ground temperatures in cold climates. Number two would be water reducers and super plasticizers, which could help achieve that required slump with less water in the mix and may provide higher strength concrete without increasing the amount of cement. These admixtures could be used when pumping concrete so that it flows more easily through the pump itself. So number three would be set retarders. So set retarders are used to delay the setting time of concrete to ensure that the field crew has sufficient time for placement. For example, this could be used for long hauls from the batch plant to the job site. Number four would be set accelerators, which would accelerate the hydration process, shortening the setting time. These provide higher early strength development and can reduce the required curing time. And number five would be specialty admixtures, which would include a whole range of products, including densifiers, corrosion inhibitors, shrinkage control, concrete coloring, and much more. Now, too much of any admixture can have an adverse effect on the concrete. So again, proportional use and mix design is critical. So how do we ensure that the concrete we receive on the job site is actually the correct mix design? I mean, it all looks the same coming out of the truck. Well, every truck delivering concrete should be delivering it with a batch ticket, essentially a piece of paper recapping the exact concrete mix they're delivering to the job site, including what time it was prepared and many other items. So if you're placing concrete, the first thing you want to check is that batch ticket when the concrete arrives on the job. Also on most projects, the structural engineer will specify the observation and testing of cast in place concrete. So quite often there will be a third party testing agency who will take samples of the concrete from the truck and perform tests on it. The two primary tests are strength and slump tests. A slump test is completed by filling a cone with concrete and then lifting the cone and measuring the settlement of the concrete itself. Concrete that doesn't settle has zero slump, whereas concrete that may turn into a puddle would have extremely high slump. So this testing agent will grab multiple samples from the truck or during multiple pours and perform these slump and strength tests. For strength testing, they'll fill multiple test cylinders, which they'll break at standard intervals such as 7 days, 14 days, and that 28 day mark, depending on what's requested of them. Each mark, they'll record the strength of the concrete to ensure that it's meeting the project specifications. Now, remember when I said that concrete will often hit 100% at the 7 day mark? Well, let's talk about that. If a concrete supplier has to provide a 4,000 PSI concrete mix design in order to ensure that the building stays standing, then that's a big liability and cost if they don't meet those requirements. So concrete suppliers will typically test and generate mix designs well over the required or specified strength as insurance. So your concrete is going to hit a higher PSI earlier in the curing and hydration process and should ultimately achieve a higher full strength than specified. So this testing is almost necessary to ensure that your building is structurally safe to support the remainder of the building's load. 
The slump test is also performed because structural engineers will often limit how much slump is acceptable in a concrete mix design. This leads us to our next question, which is what is the difference between hydration and curing when it comes to concrete? Well, as we discussed, hydration is the actual chemical reaction, while curing is the process of maintaining moisture and temperature throughout the hydration process. There's actually quite a handful of curing methods and I've brought those up on the screen if you're interested in researching more about them. So a big thing to note is that all concrete is inevitably going to crack. So in construction, we'll add joints in the concrete, which are actually put there on purpose to control where the cracks are supposed to happen. Thus, we call them control joints. And the last thing I want to cover are common concrete issues and why they happen. Now, these issues could be a multitude of reasons, but I'll cover some of the main ones. Number one. So first up, we have issues resulting from placing concrete in extremely cold or extremely hot temperatures. Since the chemical reaction is optimal between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, there are actually standard practices to follow when placing concrete outside these ranges. If not followed or accounted for, you could potentially end up with issues such as having an overall lower compressive strength in the concrete at that 28 day mark. Number two would be dusting, which can occur when there is inadequate protection of freshly placed concrete in cold temperatures, allowing the surface to weaken as it's exposed. Number three is scaling, and this often happens when the concrete is not air entrained and is exposed to those freeze thaw conditions in the presence of moisture. Number four is crazing, which is often a result of poor or inadequate curing as a result of the dense top layer shrinking. And number five is curling, which is mostly related to moisture and temperature control, where the top layer could potentially dry and shrink with respect to the bottom layer staying the same. Now, the question is the long-term outlook of concrete as there are concerns with the amount of carbon emissions generated from cement production. So the key ingredient in cement is limestone which needs to be heated until it breaks down into a fine powder, which would become lime. The process of heating limestone is what generates a massive amount of carbon emissions as it's extremely energy intensive. So the solution lies in the replacement of limestone as the main binding agent within cement. So if you can solve that equation using a somewhat inexpensive or prevalent resource, you might be the world's next billionaire. All right, just something to ponder. So I hope you learned something from this video and as always, be better, build better, and bye for now. now.